Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. As we return to our study in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, shall we praise our Heavenly Father for the light that he is revealing and ask him to guide us further so that we might more clearly understand all that is required of us in order for his spirit to be poured out as the latter rain. Shall we ask for his guidance now in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for these many opportunities that you have provided for us to learn more of you and to be guided by you so that the changes that need to occur within us may occur, may happen. Direct us, Father. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to grow in grace, in humility, to grow so that we may give this message that you need given, as you have given and shown throughout Scripture, especially in the book of Ezekiel. Help us, Father, that we may also fully and more directly understand that which you are expressing to us from the book of Zechariah, so that the oil that is to be poured out may be poured on those that are willing to do what you would have them to do. May your angels attend us today, wherever we are. May your spirit enlighten our minds, direct us now, help us to understand. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the last bit that we covered last week is the paragraph that is before us. If we have thought about this at all this week, we should have been able to come to one conclusion in unity. Paragraph reads, we are to be consecrated channels through which the heavenly life is to flow to others. The Holy Spirit is to animate and pervade the whole church, purifying and cementing hearts. Those who have been buried with Christ in baptism are to rise to newness of life, giving a living representation of the life of Christ. Upon us is laid a sacred shard. The commission has been given us. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. You are dedicated to the work of making known the gospel of salvation. Heaven's perfection is to be your power. Ninth Testimony 20, paragraph 2. Now, does anywhere the Savior say you are to cast out people that you disagree with no but i mean there is casting out people who are living in open sin and rebellion against god all right you know there there is there is there is a place for disfellowship right okay um, but you know this this type of thing of just sort of shunning people because you disagree on some points, is not a reason for disfellowship. Okay. Now, from the chat, the comment is made that we have a 20th day, ninth month in reference. Are you speaking yeah, of... Well, nine, excuse me? 90, 90, page 20. Right. And if we take the the verse numbers of that with Matthew, we would also have 2019 if we're re, if we're reading that in reverse. But going yeah. back, going back overall to the question, yes, I agree. If you're living in open sin, if you are not willing to follow what Scripture is showing, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But when you di just decide you disagree with someone, is that a reason to cast them out? No. As Ellen White says, if a brother differ, you know, don't represent him as a heretic. 
uh, don't misrepresent his, him to others, don't misrepresent what he's teaching, but sit down with him, take the time to understand what he's teaching, go through it point by point, because you may be in error. It may be right. something that you need to learn. So we haven't seen that in, in the movement, that willingness to spend the time studying things out. And right. which which to me is is important like it, it doesn't even people that aren't in the movement who who teach strange things i spend time with them one is you're to win people when people are in error there is ways to minister to them and work with them you know it was uh kind of interesting um if you remember chuck holmes yes quite uh, much his his grandson uh emailed me yesterday oh really and uh, yeah and he just wanted to know about my interaction with his grandfather and, and um you know he he was also thankful that i had um given um chuck an opportunity to present his ideas and you know and that was really an important important to me uh because i really valued chuck and um you know, that's one of the things that Jeff was upset with me about is when when I let Chuck share um, on a Zoom meeting, it got back to Jeff, and Jeff made a comment. He says, now I know where the next uh, fanaticism is going to come from. And that was in July of 2020. So that was just before, you know, what happened, you know, the disappointment. So I thought that was, to me, it was just kind of bizarre that because you let somebody share, that somehow, and, you know, and they just, Jeff disagreed with what uh, Chuck was doing. They had already looked at what Chuck had said and just decided it was error. So for me to, uh, to give Chuck a forum uh, was considered uh, a bad idea. And one of the reasons that Jeff gave that, you know, before July 18, he stopped listening to me. I think it was actually before that, but it was one of the, uh, <clears throat> I guess, maybe the straw that broke the camel's back. I don't know. But but I think it's really important that uh, you give people an opportunity to share their views and, and to discuss it. I, I don't think it, it makes sense to... to uh, I'm not a gatekeeper for everyone to decide what is true and what isn't true. People need to hear things for themselves and decide. So that fits in what, with what you're talking about. When Mrs. White is giving us the example that we are to be consecrated channels, it goes right back to a lot of what we had read in Zechariah. Because... In Zechariah, we have the representation of the golden pipes. Now, the comment from the chat, when men are worshiping, adopting, and promoting strange doctrines, and then censoring and silencing others, is this not fanaticism? I would think that it is a form of fanaticism. What are these pipes from the two trees from the book of Zechariah? constructed from what are these pipes made of the golden pipes are made out of gold right now in this situation in the prophetic word is this impure gold i believe it's gold tried in the fire god's purification isn't that what we're supposed to be amen so when we are consecrated channels, we have become that gold that is tried in the fire. We have been tried. We have been made white. We have been purified. This is the admonition that Zechariah, Ezekiel, and Mrs. White are making to us at this time. Is it fanaticism to say that we seek to become what the prophets have seen. No, because that's God's 
Okay. Now, the verses as we continue. Why will you die, Israel? Is the is the che- is the title that's applied to these next verses. <clears throat> Here again, we have a new thought beginning in Ezekiel thirty three ten. Therefore, O son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Now, here's here's the situation. Are we going to look to whine because we have lived in sin? Is it anyone's fault except our own that we are in sin? No. I still shake my head of a conference employee, a pastor, of a church within the conference where I live that gave a sermon to which I have a witness. And in this sermon, he was very blunt in stating Adam and Eve really didn't do anything wrong. Now, if they didn't do anything wrong, why are we here? Now, if if we're going to pine away in our sins, if we are looking at the Hebrew word, that is used here for pine, we would be looking at Hebrew 4743. This is a primitive root to melt, figuratively to flow, to dwindle, to vanish, consume away, be corrupt, dissolve, pine away. Does something that is purified melt? Does it dissolve? First mention for this, of this particular word occurs in Leviticus 26, 39. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers, they shall pine away with them. Ezekiel uses this particular word three times, more than anyone else in Scripture. The most telling of those that come with this would be Psalms 38, 5. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. Here again, the recognition that the issue is with us, not with heaven, is something that is very hard for many to accept. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Is this turn ye, turn ye a doubling? Is this a reference to the second angel's message? I think so. Is this not a call to us to give glory to God? Amen. Is it fanaticism for us to give glory to God? Some people think so. Okay. Now, some people might think so. Some people are going to have a problem with it. Some people are going to want to tell us all that they want to see done. Letter 23, 1862. Fairly early on with Mrs. White. I was shown that God had committed your children to your trust, Brother King to fit them for heaven. Their eternal interest should be greater to you than your house, your farm, or anything else upon earth. Shut away from them every influence you can, which would lead them to lightly regard the truth. By mildness and yet with firmness of purpose, and by living faith, roll back the powerful tide of darkness Satan is pressing upon them. The Lord pities and loves them, and his arms are extended to receive them, when they shall leave sin and folly and turn unto him. He wants to prepare them as precious jewels to shine in the heavenly casket. He wants to welcome them to his sheltering arms, that he may protect them 
from Satan's power. Is this also not describing his desire for us? Amen. Men may turn their backs. Others may cast us out. Others may blame us. Yet, does do we find any shadow or turning where God and Christ are concerned? He promises that those who come to him, he will never cast out. John 6, 27 or John 6, 30. Your daughter is convinced that we have the truth. But she has a love of the world and pride of heart. Her worldly friends and relatives stand in her way. What stands in our way today? Are we like this daughter? That we have greater pride? That we know what is truth, but our pride is in the way? She fears she will have to cut loose from them. And the way to heaven seems too straight for her to follow. But I saw that she must make any sacrifice for heaven. The eternal reward is rich and glorious enough to repay her a thousand times for any sacrifice she may make. Satan is seeking to harden her heart and to lead her to carelessness. She must resist the devil. Jesus, the dear Savior, is waiting to adopt her into his family. If she will yield her heart's best affections to him, who above all others is worthy of her love, he will purify and refine her and fit her for immortality. Notice, purify, notice, refine, notice, fit. But she must have decision and not suffer Satan to use her relatives and her professed friends to lead her from God in the downward road to folly and worldly pleasure. Through these professed friends who manifest a regard for her, Satan will strew the way to hell with tempting flowers to lure her on to harden her heart and stiffen her neck against the truth. If she does this, she will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy said the angel in a solemn voice, Turn ye, turn ye, why will you die? Break the fetters of pride and folly, which would confine you, and keep you in bondage and turn to God. Several years ago, I was spending some time with a lady down in the Walla Walla area. One Sabbath, we were driving to her church. And we were having a conversation about different people that we had known. And I had to admit, with the, the road from her house to this church, that it spooked me a bit. Because the name of this road coming out of Walla Walla is Last Chance Road. Now, the reason it spooked me was that there was a, a, a guy that I had gotten to know a little bit while I was in academy. Daryl was not the tallest of people. I was probably a good four inches taller than him. But Daryl could jump and kick a basketball hoop. And knowing the, the, the kind of elevation that that takes, it's a physical accomplishment. Now, after I'd graduated, I didn't hear a lot about some of the people that were coming up after me. Daryl was in the class immediately after mine. But that summer, I'm hearing of a car wreck that happened on Last Chance Road. Daryl was in that car. Daryl didn't make it. And the lady I was speaking with looked at me with a very shocked look on her face. And she's turning white because... She knew Daryl. She knew the other members that were in that car. She remembered the car wreck that I was talking about. We never know where last chance is going to occur. We never know when our last goodbye, our last I love you, will indeed be the last. 
we have to make decisions. Next, non-published. Letter 8, 1863. Your wife has so long given her mind to frivolous things that if she had serious thoughts, they pass away like the morning dew, scarcely leaving scarcely a trace upon her mind or conduct. She does not choose for her society those of experience and elevated substantial minds, but it is natural for her to associate with young and frivolous minds. It is time for her to think seriously, soberly, of her soul's salvation. Unless she possesses a determination and purpose and a perseverance exceeding anything she has yet manifested, she will pass heedlessly along the path of vanity and folly until it is too late for her to reform, too late to obtain salvation, too late to hear the sweet voice of mercy, and her eternal destiny will be forever fixed. God calls upon her now to renounce the world with its desires, with its vanities and follies, and seek substantial joys. She will have to make a greater and more determined effort than she ever yet has made. Angels of God are watching the development of character and weighing the moral worth. So, development of character, whether we are growing or regressing, whether we are increasing our moral worth or decreasing our moral worth. What shall they record concerning your wife at present? Her record is of but little worth anywhere. Unfit to bear alone the responsibilities of her little family. Relying upon others for that help that she is capable of rendering herself. As regards doing others good and exerting saving influence, she tells nothing there. The weight in the scale on every side is very light, except in the direction of vanity and folly. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Ezekiel 33:11. We are in this world to be of some use to others around us, to exert a saving influence, to be God's workmen to save ourselves and shed a holy saving influence around us. God help you both to be united to serve and glorify God, to take an exalted, elevated position, and both be fitting for immortality. In this letter, would this wife have had Meany, Meany, Tekel, Eupharson applied to her life if she continued with the kind of friends and the kind of thoughts that were being described. Is that yes, what? Yes, she would. Now, is that what we want to see happen to ourselves? No, I'm thinking maybe this was a warning to the whole church because look, look at the year of publication, 1863. Was the church becoming shallow and frivolous and uniting with the world? Amen and amen. But sister, don't you know that numbers aren't important? Don't get me laughing. So if, if numbers aren't important, is Palmoni important? We have too many that would wish to set aside numbers, especially the symbolic use of numbers. Yet, who is Palmoni? Christ himself. And the meaning of Palmoni? A wonderful number. If numbers aren't important... That's the same thing as saying that Christ is not important. Those that would say that numbers and the symbolic use of numbers are not important are just as surely setting aside Christ as those that are choosing to follow after the fallen churches. Consider that. Now, this next document, letters 66 to 1874. While we're reading this, some may wish to look it up to see who this letter is written to. On this, we need to pay attention. Specifically, we need to pay attention as to who this is written to. And we need to look at the time in which it is written. Mrs. White writes, how does your past life look in comparison with overcoming as Christ overcame? Compare your life of indifference, of serving God at will and letting it alone at pleasure with the life of Christ. 
you have no real sense of the Christian life. If you had only borne one proving of God, but you have not. You have shown that you had no real oil in your vessel with your lamp. And like the foolish virgins, you are coming up to the day of God without oil. The oil is divine grace. The oil is moral power. Is she being direct to the person to whom this letter is written? Is she being callous? Is she being overly harsh? She's being really harsh, but I guess it's needed. It says if you had only born one proving of God, but you have not. That's horrible. And I know 66 and an 18, a three sixes there in the reference. Right. So now my question for you, has anyone accepted my challenge to look to see who this is written to? To me? <laughs> to all of us? Well, it's, it is written to all of us per se, yes. This is letter 66, 1874. Written to Willie White or James White. James White, right? James Edson White. Is that who it's written to? Yeah, Edson. So it's Edson White. So the other this, side. Right. So yeah. this being written to Edson White is written to her son. She is telling Edson at this time, you have no oil. You have not borne a single proving of God in 1874. Yeah, it starts out with Brother Butler is acquainted with your life at Ann Arbor and with matters at Battle Creek. So um, and Brother Butler was supposed to talk with him as well. And he's being told, be careful how you meet this talk with Brother Butler. Mm-hmm. She was not above publicly remonstrating her children. She made this as direct as possible. If this was written to us today, how would we take this letter? She continues. It is of no use, my children, to make child's play of the service of Christ. If you ever stand in the kingdom of glory among the blood-washed throng who have come up through the great tribulation, you will know what heart anguish is in battling with selfishness and sin. Favorite sins will have to be overcome and self-crucified. The spirit of humility and meekness and true holiness must characterize your lives. It is with you now or never. It is with us now or never. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Ezekiel 33, 11. Now is the time of preparation. None need to expect that God will do the work of preparing and fitting them up without their efforts. Oh, all we need is the love of Christ. All we need is to accept Jesus. We don't have to do anything else. I can continue smoking. I can continue drinking. I can continue in whatever else I want to hold on to. God will do it all for me. What she said right here. None need to expect that God will do the work of preparing and fitting them up without their efforts. We are responsible to make the effort that we want to be part of the kingdom to come. It is for them to work the works of righteousness and crowd all the right doing they can into the little space of time allotted to them before probation closes, that they may have a clean record in heaven. I close the entreaty. I close with the entreaty of the prophet. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die? Where in the pages of God's word is such teaching to be found? Will the redeemed in heaven be lost to all emotions of pity and compassion and even to feelings of common humanity? Are these to be exchanged for the indifference of the stoic or the cruelty of the savage? No, no. Such is not the teaching of the book of God. Those who present the views expressed in the quotations given above may be learned and even honest men, 
but they are deluded by the sophistry of Satan. He leads them to misconstrue strong expressions of scripture, giving to the language the coloring of bitterness and the malignity which pertains to himself, but not to our creator. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn away from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? Great Controversy, 1888 edition, page 535.2. God's judgments will be visited upon those who are seeking to oppress and destroy his people. His long forbearance with the wicked emboldens men in transgression. But their punishment is nonetheless certain and terrible because it is long delayed. The Lord shall rise up as Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Isaiah 28, 21. To our merciful God. The act of punishment is a strange act. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 33, 1. The Lord is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means clear the guilty. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. Exodus 34, 6 and 7, Nahum 1, verse 3. By terrible things in righteousness, he will vindicate the authority of his downtrodden law, the severity of the retribution awaiting the transgressor may be judged by the Lord's reluctance to execute justice. The nation with which he bears long, and which he will not smite until it has filled up the measure of its iniquity in God's account, will finally drink the cup of wrath unmixed with mercy. When Christ ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark, Revelation 14, 9 and 10, will be poured out. Now, can we dispute this direct statement? When Christ stands up, when he leaves the sanctuary, when he lays off the robes of high priest and accepts the kingly vestiture, the unmingled wrath of God will be poured out. Is this not the time where the seven last plagues are poured out upon mankind that have chosen to reject God? Amen. Are those plagues being poured out right now? Are those plagues being poured out right now? I would say there's a foretaste of them, but not the actual. How can they be? How can we think that they are being poured out? Because if we are trying to state that, then Christ has ceased his intercession in the sanctuary then there is no hope for man whatsoever. The plagues upon Egypt when God was about to deliver Israel were similar in character to those more terrible and extensive judgments which are to fall upon the world just before the final deliverance of God's people. Says the revelator in describing these terrific scourges, there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. The sea became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the rivers and fountains of waters became blood. Revelation 2-6, to six, Revelation 16, 8 and 9. Terrible as these inflictions are, God's justice stands fully vindicated. The angel of God declares, 
Thou art righteous, O Lord, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. By condemning the people of God to death, as they have truly incurred the guilt of their blood, as if it had been shed by their hands. In like manner, Christ declared the Jews of his time guilty of all the blood of the holy men, which had been shed since the days of Abel. For they possessed the same spirit and were seeking to do the same work with these murderers of the prophets. The voice which penetrates the ear of the dead, they know. How often have its plaintive tender tones called them to repentance? How often has it been heard in the touching entreaties of a friend, of a brother, a redeemer? To the rejecters of his grace, no other <clears throat> could be so full of condemnation, so burdened with denunciation, as that voice which has so long pleaded, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? Oh, that it were to them the voice of a stranger. Says Jesus, I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Proverbs 1, 24 and 25. The, that voice awakens memories which they would fain blot out. Warnings despised, invitations refused, privileges slighted. The forbearance of God has exercised toward the wicked, emboldens men in transgression, but their punishment will be nonetheless certain and terrible for being long delayed. The Lord will rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, that the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. The Lord is merciful and gracious, is long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means clear the guilty. Is Exodus 34, 6, and 7. While he does not delight in vengeance, he will execute judgment upon the transgressors of his law. He is forced to do this, to preserve the inhabitants of the earth from utter depravity and ruin. In order to save some, he must cut off those who have become hardened in sin. The Lord is slow to anger, and is great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. Nahum 1.3 By terrible things in righteousness, he will vindicate the authority of his downtrodden law. By the very fact, his reluctance to execute judgment testifies to the enormity of the sins that call forth his judgments and to the severity of the retribution awaiting the transgressor. We have choices to make. We have a heaven to gain and only sin to lose. Is that such a hard trade? If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Romans 5.10 did Saul of Tarsus set out to be a friend of God? No. Well, I think he did because he thought he was doing God's service when he was slaughtering Christians. Right. Yet, he was an enemy because he did not understand. He was so willing to accept whatever the rabbis told him that he became an enemy, yet he was reconciled to God by the death of Christ. Yet Saul of Tarsus became Paul. What greater assurance can we have of the willingness, yea, the yearning, longing of Christ to have all come to him 
believe him that they might have eternal life. Oh, when we see the sorrows and sufferings of loved ones, shall we turn away from Christ dissatisfied, murmuring and complaining? No, I say no. That is the time to come closely to the only one who can be our helper in every time of need. We have no time for repining now. No time for unbelief now. No time to let go of Jesus. Now is the time when trial comes to press close to the bleeding side of Jesus. When the whole world was under condemnation, Christ took upon himself the guilt of the sinner. He bore the wrath of God for the transgressor and thus suffering the penalty of sin. He ransoms the sinner. Had it been the choice of God to destroy the disobedient, he might, in justice, have swept the earth clean of the guilty transgressors. But he reveals himself as a compassionate, loving father. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Ezekiel 33.11, Ezekiel 18.32. Turn ye and live. Let not books be placed before the workers, which if they do not mislead and corrupt the mind, will still give to the mind a disrelish for the word of God, which brings to view matters of eternal interest. Let the truth of God be subject for contemplation and meditation. The Bible is God's letter to man in which his instruction as to how to become rich in heavenly graces to secure for the believer the life that shall measure with the life of God. Read the Bible and regard it as the voice of God speaking directly to your soul. Then will you find inspiration, that wisdom which is divine. There is no time for engaging in trifling amusements and the gratification of selfish propensities. Any question on that paragraph? How do you see it? Is this not clear that the admonitions that are written in the Bible are written to us personally? They sure are. Yes, yep. yes it is clear. <laughs> it's a letter to us. So why are we having such a hard time with this right now? Where's the problem coming from? Is it coming is it coming because God is not being clear in what he wants and what he's desiring? God's been more than clear. Okay. Uh, yeah. The problem is uh, a lot of people uh they expect uh, a miraculous change, not knowing that uh uh, the admonition which comes from the word of God, we need to work upon it. But a lot of people, the way they think, like the way the Holy Spirit works, it's uh, totally different to how they see it. But as right. we understand that, yes. I wasn't trying to interrupt you. Continue, if you will. Yeah, it's what, what I was saying is uh, when the word of God uh, speaks to us, we understand that's the word of God. It's the one which is, which is going to give us life. Uh, we understand it. So we understand that the way the spirit works, it's not the way. Even Sister White says that change does not come in a miraculous way. It is when we hear the word and apply it, then change comes. Exactly. Now, this letter, letter 31 of 1891, is something that is for our admonition today. I recommend for this week that we all take a little time and consider the admonition that she has given within this letter. Apply it directly to our lives individually. Let this work begin here. And prepare us for what we are about to study this following week. 
Any other comments, questions, or concerns at this time? Um, I, I listened to Kelly's uh, Vespers yes. uh, last night. Okay. And people should listen to that. It was very, very powerful, uh, Kelly's testimony. But it also shows, you know, we, we can't give up on people. Um, you know, if God doesn't give up on us. And so often it's easy to write somebody off um, and sometimes write ourselves off because we've disappointed God so many times. But God gives this counsel to us because of his love for us. And uh, Kelly likened it to, you know, the sort of the, the wave of God's grace and mercy pounding upon us. Keep coming back, you know, the tide keeps returning. And, and giving and God giving us an opportunity, and we can't turn down that opportunity, much as we uh, we sometimes feel disappointed in ourselves. So, so this counsel from God, I mean, we need to see it as part of God's love for us, not you know God rejecting us. Okay. So now we have two things to consider: Letter Thirty One of eighteen ninety one and Kelly's Vespers from last night. We will need to consider these carefully before our meeting again this next Sabbath. So that is your homework for this week. Shall we now close in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these words of admonition. We thank you for how straight, direct, blunt, and direct they are for us today. Help us to consider what you are saying, what you are presenting, and how you are telling us this. May your will be done. May your name and character be glorified. Help us to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.